This is a free recording by Cambridge Cookbooks, etc. We hope you enjoy and benefit from the content. Also, please consider donating to the new Cambridge Mosque. Please visit Cambridge Mosque is moving dot org dot uk. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدن ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ماكتين فيه أبدا وينذر الذين قالوا اتخذ الله ولدا ما لهم به من علم ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وإليه تصير أمور وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فهو الرحمة المهداء والنعمة المصداء والسراج المنير اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله الأبطار وأصحابه الأخيار ومن اتبع سنته وسار على نهجه إلى يوم الدين أما بعض فيا أيها الإخوة المؤمنون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مثل الذين حملوا التوراة ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا بئس مثل القوم الذين كذبوا بآياتنا والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين صدق الله العظيم In this ayah Allah سبحانه وتعالى says the likeness of those who were required to carry the Torah and then did not carry it is the likeness of a donkey carrying scrolls. Wicked is the likeness of those who deny our signs and Allah does not guide the unjust. It's a well-known ayah. And its first instance and its context in the Qur'an is the Bani Israel those who were given the incomparable blessing of divine revelation and then refused to carry it. <clears throat> those who were charged with a message at the hand of prophet after prophet after prophet but repeatedly turned aside. The Old Testament is the story of that. <coughs> repeated reminders and repeated willful stiff-necked turning away. Charged with the book, asked to carry it, the yoke of the law as they put it, but then they do not carry it. Perhaps they ask others to. Perhaps it's too hard. Perhaps it's inconvenient. Perhaps they come up with dubious reinterpretations to make life a little bit easier. In any case, they don't carry it. So Allah says, they are denying our signs. Allah has given them, giving them this as a blessing, as a light, as a nur, and they are trying to find ways around it. They're not applying it to themselves. And then Allah does not guide the people who are unjust. This is zulm. Allah gives you the light, you prefer the shadows, you do not apply his justice, you are a worker of injustice. One of the larger meanings of this is the warning, the dire and unconditional warning that is directed against religious leaders, usually men of religion, who are required to carry, more than anyone else, the yoke of the law, but when it comes to the crunch, fail to do so. <coughs> those who do not stand up for the poor, for the dispossessed, for those who are victims of injustice, but prefer some uh, pomp and circumstance of their own. Unfortunately, in our age, many religious leaders do just that. They seem to have forgotten that one of the basic points of the seerah of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that the Quraysh would have offered him anything and everything if only he had stopped telling people about Tawheed. But he tells them, even if I had the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I would not abandon this mission. And he goes into exile, threatened with death, assassination attempts, faced with poverty and destruction, but he does not waver for a moment. And that is part of the responsibility of the religious leader. In a time of crisis, 
he has to continue to lead. He cannot be a fair weather leader, he has to be the real thing. Unfortunately, in our age, there are people who accept positions of rank and prestige. They go to swanky conferences. They are quoted as the mufti of here, or the imam of there, and they're very happy with that. But when it comes to the crunch, when there is a crisis, they are nowhere to be seen. You might have seen the amateur video footage taken of the Salat of Juma in Tunis, I think it was two weeks ago. Somebody went to Juma with a camcorder, and it was broadcast everywhere. There they are in the mosque in Tunis, and the mosque is full. And the old imam gets up, the government man, the one who's been chosen, cherry-picked to give a chutzpah that is of no relevance to anyone, and he gets up the minbar, and he reaches into his pocket, and he brings out the regime's chutzpah, and starts to read it. And it bears no relation to anything that's going on in the street. The city's on fire, but he's talking about something disconnected. After a few minutes, some people get up and walk out. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to pray behind him. Others start pointing at him and talking and shouting angrily. And eventually, after ten minutes, he realizes that the game is up and he gets down off the minbar and doesn't complete his khutbah. And then there stands up the old imam, the one who, on whose face you can see light, who is deposed and maltreated by the regime. He gets up onto the minbar and he completes the khutbah this time is telling people things that they need to hear. How to be restrained, how to be noble, how to be dignified, but not sparing the regime the necessary criticism which Allah's justice requires him to make. Very iconic moment. He's now a hero, and you see him being more or less mobbed outside by excited young people. What happens to the old guy, the man who is on the payroll of the regime, who kind of creeps off into the shadows? How will he end his days how will he be seen in his neighborhood? He took a chance and uh, the regime let him down. These are critical times. Critical times not just for those regimes, but critical times also for those who claim to be upholding the kalima of Islam. They too are being tested. Future generations will remember whether or not they were heard. Whether they are leading the prayers in the Tahrir Square in a peaceful and honorable way in the tradition of Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi Ali Munkar, which is more a duty for the ulama than for anyone else, saving only the, the Anbiya, or whether they're kind of watching it at home on TV and wondering whether they'll still have a job in a month's time. Where are all of those ministers and muftis and the men who uh, hover around the buffet at those nice international Islamic conferences when they're really needed, when the people are in a state of bewilderment? Are they being heard, or are they just like the donkeys carrying books. In the end, um, they don't benefit at all from what they're carrying. There's a story in the Qur'an which is about this, or seems to be about this. And most of the ulama say that it is. Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Abbas both have uh, commentaries on it in which they say, yes, this is the, the subject. وَاتْلُوا عَلَيْهِ نَبَأَ الَّذِي آتَيْنَاهُ آيَاتِنَا فَانْسَلَخَ مِنْهَا and recite to him the story of the one to whom we gave our signs, and then he departed from them, and followed the shaitan, and became one of those who were lost, really gone. Had we wished, we could have raised him up by that. By the scripture which we gave him, we could have raised him up high. But he chose to stay on the ground. And this is an Arabic expression. And ikhladu fil aruq means to stay at ground level, not to aspire to anything, to be lazy, to lie around, to be in the dust, and not to be aspirational. And he followed his own power, his own preference. He's been given the signs, but he chooses his own preference. He'd rather go to the conference again and be regarded as some big shot on, on TV. If the crunch has come, and he'd rather keep his head down and hope for the best. In the Quran says something interesting. His likeness, not the donkey this time, his likeness is the likeness of a dog, which keeps panting. Some dogs just pant all the time. They've been resting for half an hour, but still it's... There are some dogs that are like that. Whether you do something with it or give it something, it still pants. If you leave it alone, it still pants. 
What is the dog panting for? Well, it's as though it wants a drink. You want, it wants a bone to be thrown to it. And that's what those scholars are like. Whatever happens, whatever comes to them, good or evil, they're always hoping for some bone to be thrown to them. And a dog is not a high form of life. The same kind of expression that we heard in the ayah that we began the khutbah with, that is the likeness of those who deny our science. They're reciting the leading tarawih, who knows? But at the crunch, they follow their hawa. When push comes to shove, that's really what they want to do. So they recite the story, perhaps people will think. And this is crunch time for many of the ulama of Islam. We have to remember what is the responsibility of the alim. The alim is not some kind of fair weather friend who sits around in the mosque and tells you lovely stories. He's the one who leads you and sticks his neck out and is the first one to be tortured, to be bad mouthed, to lose his job, whatever, if that's what he needs to do. And this is from the seerah. Part of the following of the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that you are with the poor, you are against injustice because you know that Allah does not love those who are unjust. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shall I tell you who are the kings of the people of Jannah? Bala Ya Rasulullah. Please do, Ya Rasulullah. <coughs> Every person who has been wronged, who is dusty and disheveled, who nobody points out to with any respect. They are the kings in the Akhirah. They are the ones, the Mustad'afun, for whom the prophetic message is the greatest liberation. For everybody, it's a liberation from nafs and ego. For some who are downtrodden in the dust in this world, it can be a huge liberation in dunya terms as well. And these are the kings of the people of the next world, not those presidents and people who are kings now, unless they repent, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in their heart. But we judge because they are presenting themselves as people of justice on the grounds of their own claims, and we find them in just about every case to be wanting, and whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, nobody is impressed by them. That's something that is a kind of global ijma. And then look at their situation now, the Tunis situation again. Who are they relying upon? The president of Tunis is offered out of the kindness of the heart of the French government. President Sarkozy said, would you like me to send you 300 riot police in order to support you? He's a very old friend. They speak the same language, they have close political ties. Here is 300 riot police. The next day, the president is fleeing Tunis in his plane, and the French won't even allow him into their airspace. That is how reliable those people are. And they say, diplomacy, in diplomacy there are no friends, there are only interests. Sometimes we tend to forget that. But religion, <coughs> the alim is somebody you can rely upon. <coughs> and it is nowhere to be seen when something needs to be done. When the people is calling for, for, for taghir, for change, for an amr bil ma'ruf and an nahi an al which Imam al-Ghazali calls a ruqn al-a'zam min al the greatest pillar of religion, part of the essence of prophecy, if the guys in Turban are not kind of around, then there's a problem. There is a problem, not just for them, but for the population, because that's when they're most needed. Historically, however, the ulama have been different, and there are so many stories, reassuring, beautiful stories, in our history of the ulama not hesitating. In Bosnia, for instance, just to take one example, one of my favorite Bosnian characters in the story is characteristically dubious in a kind of humorous Bosnian way. Hassan Kaimi, one of the three great scholars of Bosnia, he's from the 17th century, and he has books and diwans and a uh, classic scholar. One night he's coming out of his mosque, it's dark, it's windy, it's cold, it's rainy. He has a candle, and a gust of wind blows out the candle and he's in complete darkness. And he says, oh Allah, you've left me in this darkness, what can I do? And he reaches out with his candle towards the minaret of the mosque, and the candle, by a karama, comes back to light again. And at that point, where all of us would say, hey, I must be a big shot, my prayers are answered, he is absolutely devastated. This is the worst moment in his life because he realizes people are now going to refer to me as some kind of special person and my niya is going to be damaged. And so, according to the story, he spends the rest of the night in the local tavern so that everybody will be outraged. And sure enough, the next day, the population is saying, who is this Munaf imam? And they chase him out of town and he has to spend the rest of his life in Zvornik where he's buried in eastern Bosnia. If you look at the historical records, however, you find that there's more to it than that. 
At that time, there were bread riots in Sarajevo. 1682, there's been hoarding. Even the Qadi is involved with hoarding bread and not giving it, giving it to the starving population. People are angry, they're rioting in the streets, the law court is, burst down, is burned down. Hassan Qaimi apparently is with the crowd. That's why he's exiled. Another example, famous Moroccan saint, Sidi Lassen Yusuf in, in, in Morocco. Famous sage, charismatic figure from the deep desert. And he is angry with the Sultan. The Sultan is being, building the walls of Meknes. And so many people are dying. They're being treated like slaves. They're dying every day. They're being flogged to death, overworked, not paid. And uh, the, the, the Sayyid is angry with this. And the Sultan invites him to stay with him in Ramadan. He says, I want the blessing of your presence in my palace during Ramadan. So the Sheikh stays in the palace during Ramadan. Every evening, the kitchen sends to him a meal. And every evening, after he finishes the meal, he breaks the crockery. He deliberately breaks it. At the end of Ramadan, the Sultan hears of this and says, I invite you to my house. This is the sacred state of hospitality. And all you can do is break my crockery. And what the sheikh says, completely without fear, is, I just break the crockery that is made of, made of earth. But you break Allah's crockery. You break human beings. And the sultan is angry. And again, he goes into exile. And he's discharged his obligation as a, as a Muslim leader, as an imam, as a sayyid. And this is what we expect. Just last week, last Friday, I was in a town which I didn't know enough about. Toba, sometimes called Toba Dar es Salaam, in uh, Senegal. And it's the holy city of Senegal, half a million people. And it's called Toba because it was founded by a great uh, sheikh, uh, Serene Ahmed Bamba Mbake, uh, who was sitting under a baobab tree and decided that he wanted his followers to make hijrah to this part of Senegal to go out and cultivate uh, the desert. And now, from a tree, it's become a city of half a million or so people. And it's very extraordinary, and you get a sense of the, the power of the niya of that man. The city is a holy city, so there are strict rules there. No alcohol, no smoking, no music, no dancing, and they enforce it pretty strictly. If you hear somebody's mobile phone going off in the mosque, it's not going to be music, it'll be for an or some nasheed. No music in Toba. But it's Africa, so people are kind of, it's a cheerful, happy place, but really a religious city. Mosques everywhere. You hear Qur'an all night long, and it's um, a city where people come to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The great event of that city is the festival, which is called the Magal, which just finished last week. Officially, about two million people come for this. Probably the number is larger. Some people say it's actually busier than the Hajj, Allahu Alam. People come for several days and they listen to Qur'an and there are uh, lectures and there are lots of nasheed and uh, they go back spiritually recharged. But if you ask them, why was this festival instituted? Is it the birthday of uh, Sirin Ahmed al-Bamba who is buried there? It's not his birthday. Was it the day when he died? Is Arus, as you would say, in, in the subcontinent? No, it wasn't the day when he died. It was the day when he was arrested by the French authorities. And Ahmad al-Bamba wrote in his diary. I saw some of the scholars just kind of letting it happen. But I was opposed. This is why I took my followers far away. And the French came after me because they thought I was a threat. And the moment they put the chains on me, that Allah opened his mysteries to me. And from that time on, he became an extraordinarily prolific writer. You can go into bookshops, and there's lots of bookshops in Tulba around the mosque. And the bookshop is entirely his books. <coughs> So many collections of poetry, so many books of Firkan, a very profound, great scholar in Arabic, Wolof, the local language, uh, a very serious person. So the French took him away in chains. They wouldn't let him pray. And they'd tell you lots of stories there. The village people will say, well, he was taken on the ship to Gabon, a non-Muslim place, where the French were sending him into exile. They wouldn't let him pray on the ship. And they said, the rule is nobody's allowed to pray on this ship. This is a French government ship. We don't do prayers. And so, according to the story, he steps off the ship and says his prayers on the sea, and then comes back onto the ship again, and the French uh, think this is strange, doesn't break the rules, and according to the story, anyway, this is what he does. Many miracles, many karamat are related of him. But this extraordinary thing is, for them, the moment of his opening was the moment when he did courageously say, I'm not going to accept some medal or some dubious position with these foreigners taking over my country. 
I will speak against it. And if necessary, I will go into exile and leave my family and followers in chains. And I rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result of that decision, everybody there loves him. His name is on all of the bumper stickers and his name, inshallah, in heaven is higher still. So we need to ask ourselves, in these times, when a lot of people are being tested, where are the real ulama? Where are the real muftis, those who are prepared to say, we don't want violence, we don't want anything to get hurt or broken, but we do think that peaceful protest against systems that have been trampling on our rights for decades are not only permissible, but actually required by the religion of Islam. And finally, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the best of the works and the intentions of those who are now campaigning for a better world in the Middle East and elsewhere in this Ummah, inshallah, to protect the weak amongst them, to protect the women and children, to inspire mercy into the hearts of the police, the security forces, the, the army, the politicians, everybody there, so that this situation may be resolved in a way that Allah and his messenger love, so that this will be the opening of the door to a new era after a very dark era, inshallah, rather than the opening of the door into more chaos and more ego. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is powerful over that, and inshallah, this is his adu'a. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولي المتقين مكال الظالمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين محمد رسول الله صادق وعد الأمين أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله فإنه خير الزاد وإياكم محدثات الأمور فكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار واعلموا أن الله قد أمركم بأمر عظيم أمركم بالصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين فقال عز وجل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سقتك والنار يا عالم السر منا لا تهتك السفر عنا وعافنا وعف عنا وكلنا حيث كنا يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أمتنا على دين الإسلام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أمتنا على دين الإسلام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أمتنا على دين الإسلام ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ووافق الله مولاة أمور المسلمين إلى العمل بكتاب الله وصنة خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم ودعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أعلى وأولى وأعز وأجل وأتم وأكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة